just growing up as a person in society, it's like in the air, right? Like the romantic notion of the genius artist is not an old lady in a quilt shop. Like far, far from it. You're listening to Seamside, where we explore the inner work of textiles. I'm your host, Zach Foster. And today we sit down with textile artist, performance artist, painter, and probably some other things too, Leslie Rogers. In this conversation, Leslie and I discuss how to set fire to quilts without burning them up, how to make quilts float on water the old-fashioned way, and the non-hierarchical thingness of things. Have you got your tiny quilt video tutorial yet? I made it, and it's sitting there in the show notes just waiting for you. Feel free to download it if you're looking for a free 30 minutes sitting and sewing time with yours truly. You'll learn all kinds of basic hand sewing techniques that you can scale up to make non-tiny quilts if you want to. Just check the link in the show notes below to get started. Y'all, let's take a look at this review that came in recently. Warmed my heart tremendously. It comes from Jeannie Bernard, who says, I have learned more from the interviews on Seamside than taking a college course in textiles. How you like that? Well, Jeannie, you're in for a treat because today we're talking to somebody who teaches art in a university. Double bonus. If you're feeling like Jeannie and you're really getting a lot out of this podcast, there is one little thing you could do that I would really appreciate. And that is leave me a kind five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It is the best way for folks to discover the magic that is Seamside. Leslie Rogers is an unpinnable butterfly of a human being. Her creative practice flits from quilts to performance to garment making to puppetry. She's a deeply thoughtful artist whose often whimsical or jarring pieces are underpinned by hours of historical research. Leslie and I met at Penland, and if her name sounds familiar, it's because she came up in my conversation recently with Paolo Arau. That episode, How to Bring It All Together, is a treat in and of itself, and I'd encourage you to give that one a listen too. In this conversation, Leslie and I discuss how to set fire to quilts without burning them up, how to make quilts float on water, you know, the old-fashioned way, and the non-hierarchical thingness of things. I hope you enjoy How to Dance in a Quilt with my good friend, Leslie Rogers. Leslie, thank you so much for joining me here. Thank you. Can you paint the scene for us a little bit? Where are you sitting right now? Well, I'm sitting in the most favorite green velvet chair of all the cats that live in this house, of which there are three. This house is my partner's house, but I guess also my house. (laughs) Now, Leslie, you and I first met. Mm Mm-hmm. About a year ago to date at Penland, when we were both there for the winter residency. You remember that? Yes, it was lovely. It was so beautiful. I mean, it's just this little mountaintop oasis of craft and art and a little bit of snow here and there. And just real, just a lot of quiet is what I remember. Yes, that was my first, the first word in my mind as well, that it was very peaceful. I want to get back at some point in our conversation about the project that you were working on and I think are still working on mm-hmm. that you started at Penland, but we'll get to that in a minute. We have another point of connection as well, and that's our good friend Paolo Rao. Yes, yes. God, I love that guy. Perfect Paolo. Perfect Paolo. <laughs> well, it was, it was just a few weeks ago that Paolo and I were talking, and in the middle of this conversation, Paolo's like, oh. Leslie. And I'm like, yeah, I need to talk to Leslie on this show. So thank you for joining me. We both drew that day in that conversation, two cards from the tarot deck, three of wands, three of swords. And I'm thinking you are the third in the triad of this conversation. So thank you for hopping in. Wow. Thank you. I'm I'm so uh, appreciative of being invoked by the tarot. Yeah, but no cosmic (laughs) pressure. All right. No cosmic pressure. (laughs) I have enough cosmic pressure. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So Leslie, you do so much in your creative practice that I'm hesitant to put any labels on you whatsoever. So I'm just going to ask you if you could <laughs> describe yourself for us. What do you do? Yes. Whew, what do I do? I like to frame it in terms of things I learned in school and things I learned outside of school. Outside of school, I 
was trained in quilting and garment making from when I was like seven to 11, I went to lessons. Then later in life, after beginning college for art, I started working with Bread and Puppet Theater a bit and their vast community of former collaborators and performers. And that turned into a lot of puppetry and a puppet theater group that I had. It, it took a long time for all that to coalesce, but my work now tends to be based in quilt research from which I find characters and engage in a lot of performance for live audiences or video. Does that sound right? <laughs> that sounds perfect. <laughs> Leslie, can you describe for us the very first quilt you ever made? Mm, that I can. I will first describe how it came to fruition. <laughs> I, My mom really idolized someone she grew up with who made all their clothes. And when well, she had me, she wanted to head off the phase in life where your kid cares a lot about fashion and is asking for expensive clothes. She decided that at, starting at age seven, she would send me to sewing lessons so that later when I hit that phase, I would have enough skills that she could say, no, go make your own. <laughs> of course, when that phase did come, it was all about the brand. So it was ineffective to complete <laughs> But I will say, actually, yes, later when I was into styling myself in high school, I did make a lot of clothes and I made really weird clothes and they were all out of like cartoon bed sheets from the thrift store on half price day and lots of ruffles. And she was very uh, embarrassed. <laughs> she probably was like, why did I ever send <laughs> Leslie to sewing class? <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe. Who knows? <laughs> she, I'm sure she is very proud of me if she ever hears this. Um <laughs> But what happened was I was learning and learning and learning from my teacher about garments. And as I was learning, kind of running out of things to learn, and I was starting to feel like I wasn't encountering new challenges, I think my teacher kind of noticed. <clears throat> and she said, well, would you like to make a wall hanging? And I didn't know what she meant. I just said, okay. And uh, the sewing shop next door to a quilting shop. So she brought me over there and had me pick out a pattern and the fabrics and, uh, by, and learn how to read the back of that type. Um, and we made this quilt that was kind of, uh, it was a cat. It was a cat. I just realized that. Um, it was like a black cat in a field of grass sniffing a butterfly. And then when I was done, she showed me how to put like these loops on it to put it on a dowel so that you could hang it up and she said I said oh it was on the wall but <laughs> like I like didn't see that part coming because it was a little quilt like we were it was also a quilt and she said yeah it goes on the wall because it's art and you're a fiber artist and that was the first time I heard that term um and I think I was probably 10 something like that. Um, and so after that, I made more quilts with her, uh, more wall hanging, which pretty much to me are just smaller qu quilts that are too small. <laughs> <laughs> quilts are too small to have any other use. <laughs> Put them on the wall. You know, end up on the wall. Um, and then later when I, when I enrolled in art school, I, I didn't really have a lot of insight or guidance on picking school from, I ended up in this very traditional observational painting program. And I often remembered the conversations and kind of crit critique culture, I would say, that I was around in the quilt shop and this kind of like microculture and, and set of values that existed there about skill and about aesthetics. And I think the friction between the two ways of thinking about making art for the wall bothered me so much. Um, just knowing that there was this kind of hierarchy of status and monetary value and um, ideas of intellect. I don't know. I just, I felt like, well, I do both these things. So I am credible to say that's bullshit. <laughs> yes, you are. Leslie, could you say a little bit more about the difference in the two sets of values that you mentioned, the values of the quilt shop versus the value of your painting program? I mean, I won't say that there was never any point in that program where anyone said anything disparaging about quilts or fibers or crafts. 
um, because it was just so far removed from what we were doing. Um, I didn't employ any of those skills during that time at that school um, because it, it had a very, very rigid prescriptive way of working that, that was not in dialogue with any of that. As you can tell, I much enjoyed it. <laughs> it's a glowing <laughs> review, I can tell. <laughs> I did go to school with some people who really did embrace what we were learning and, and are such amazing artists now, and I admire them so much. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think like just growing up as a person in society, it's like in the air, right? Like the romantic notion of the genius artist is not an old lady in a quilt shop, like far, far from it. And in contemporary art and in modern modernism, lots of artists have responded critically to those notions for many, many years. I just would never have seen it coming that we're having this moment right now in contemporary art where if you go to a big show full of painting, it's going to be full of quilts and weaving. And in art schools, people are like ravenously quilting and weaving and designing textile prints and doing all these things that I think when I was in school and you were not specifically in a fibers program, there was some very inarticulate resistance to that. I've heard lots of things said about working with textile in programs that are anything but a fibers program uh, and especially outside of kind of craft oriented atmosphere. And I think that is falling away at a dramatic speed post pandemic. So in your perspective, what do you attribute the rise of textiles to? You know, it's hard. It, it, there's just so many ways to speculate about it. It's easy right now to attribute any change to the pandemic. And I do think that was a really big factor. During the pandemic, people reached out to me like crazy that I had known at all other points of my life saying, I'm making a quilt. I'm making my first quilt. I'm so excited. Have a meeting with me. Can I have a studio visit with you over Zoom or something? And I was like, oh, this is great. I was just excited, you know, to talk with anyone about it. And then, you know, fast forward, I had been watching a lot of this happening. And like, it was always unimaginable to me that I could really get nerdy about quilt stuff with anyone but like an academic textile historian, maybe, or like a local quilting guild of old ladies. Right. These are like the two places it was possible. And I was in a meeting last year in which Katie Schulman, who is a wonderful person and fun, sprightly entity in Detroit and an artist, wanted to organize a very kind of like casual, enthusiastic fibers club in Detroit. And so at the first meeting, everyone went around and introduced themselves and what they're looking for, what they think they have to offer to a community of fiber, fibers interested people. And she went around the room. There were a lot of people younger than me in the room. And it was like, I make quilts. I make quilts and paintings. I make quilts. I quilt. <laughs> just, like, just like one after another after another. And I just like never saw that coming. I love it. <laughs> I think too, in contemporary art, there's been a resistance to like relegated disciplines for such a long time. Finally, that has kind of spilled over into incorporating craft into everything. And I just love that. It's like doing away with an old social order of hierarchy. And that is the biggest thing I find so pleasurable about it. And just creating so much more space for so many more, more ways of making objects in this world. Yeah. How do you feel about the phrase sloppy craft? <laughs> I love it. And I admire people with sloppy craft so, so much. And I can't do it. I mean, when I do do it, it's it usually like, it doesn't look good. <laughs> Lots of people send sloppy craft that looks great and fun and active and alive and reckless and all of that in these ways that are so exciting. But in actually my fibers practice is where I get to practice pre precision. And I have engaged in a lot of art forms and projects and collaborations over the years where, like, that's just unwise to even be trying to think about. So why fibers? <laughs> what is it about fibers that allows you to relish in the precision? It's so tedious. Like, the amount of understanding you have to have to make the thing and have it hold together and, like, deal with the edges if that's what you intend to do. You can't be, like, 
in my mind, you really just can't get through it without focusing in. And it's conquerable, but very challenging. And so that really, it keeps me engaged. One of the things that you said at Penland that has always stuck with me was that quilts are begging to be performance objects because of their human scaleness, mm-hmm. right? We make these objects to cover our bodies so there's to a certain scale. And as a performance artist, which I imagine a moment ago you were alluding to perhaps being able to be less precise in performance than you are with textiles. Would you say that's true? Yeah. So then what would it look like? I want to get to <laughs> performance in a moment, but what would it look like to bring that same imprecision into a quilted piece? It would be working improvisationally. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be that, but that is one way. And I think about it all the time and I aspire to work improvisationally and come away with something that I like. There are lots of people who work improvisationally and make just incredible quilts that I love so much and just have so many little exciting nuances to them. But if I try to do it, I never come away with something I love that way. When I just go at it alone, like, I don't know what I'm doing. I feel so lost. (laughs) Hang out with me, Leslie. We'll we'll work it out. I remember one afternoon when we were at Penland and you were working on this quilted costume that you were really excited about this method of mass producing half square triangles. Do you remember this moment? Oh, yeah. Do you want to? Yeah. That. Do you want to tell us? Just <laughs> give us a little snippet of what that uh, method does for you. It makes me feel like I'm accomplishing something and doing it well. <laughs> it's because there is a certain volume of them at the end, and if I do it carefully, I end up with like a whole bunch of half squares that are all the same, and then that makes it very easy to like build something out of them without having to struggle constantly along the way with the fact that they don't fit, but. In the end, if I mass produce a bunch of perfect half square triangles, I have the ability to make these bigger effects, right? By composing and recomposing them. I could, that would be a good way to work improvisationally that I have not pursued is just composing them without plans and without a pattern in mind because they create so much consistency inherently. Well, when I was talking to Perfect Paolo, I gave him a homework assignment. So maybe this is now your homework assignment. Make a bunch of (laughs) imperfect half square triangles and just see what happens. Oh Oh my gosh. (laughs) I'm here for it. What were you working on when we were back at Penland? Why did you need so many half square triangles? Yeah, it's actually, it's a larger project that's going to, I plan for it to culminate in an exhibition and associated film called Lady of the Lake, the Milkweed Baron and the Monarch. And the way this project started was that I was at Art Farm Nebraska, an artist residency, surrounded by a prairie. I was thinking about making rope, like making the best rope that I can make, the sturdiest rope out of whatever is around. Because I had slowly kind of caught on that there are all these plants around that are really useful for cordage. So I was foraging milkweed to use the fibers in the stem. And so just out of habit, I, I researched the milkweed a little bit and I saw that the floss, the milkweed floss is the fluffy stuff that flies out of the pods every fall. I read that it is incredibly buoyant and was used to make life vests during World War II. I was totally enamored. And immediately I thought, can I stuff a quilt with it? Can I get enough of it in the quilt that I could float on that quilt? And that was when I was committed to this project. No more research. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie, how many, I don't want to interrupt your flow here, but how many people do you think have thought that same thought in all of human history? Oh, about the actual floating on it? About yeah, using milkweed to stuff a quilt so they could float? Oh, yeah. oh, the people definitely have stuffed, milk, have stuffed quilts with milkweed. But I don't know if they have tested them on the water. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yeah, so I got really deep in this history and what I learned was I learned about the milkweed baron right the title is the lady of the lake the milkweed baron and the monarch the milkweed baron is this man he was a real man named Dr. Boris Berkman he was a physician in Chicago and he had this fantasy of living the American dream by becoming an agricultural baron via industrializing milkweed which he recognized as the 
he believed was this uh, overlooked cash crop opportunity. He approached the Department of War during World War II because previously, lysis were stuffed with kapok fiber, which functionally is very, very similar to milkweed flax. And at that time, we got most of our kapok fiber from Southeast Asia and India. Because of the war with Japan, the trade routes were cut off and we couldn't get it. So how are we going to make life best for the war? So he got the Department of War to fund him, to support him in, in working the kinks out of a milkweed gin, like a cotton gin, but for milkweed. And then building 11 of them in a warehouse in Petoskey, Michigan. And the Department of War also supported him in putting out a national propaganda and foraging campaign for people to forage milkweed pods out of patriotic support of the war. When the war ended, the Department of War pulled the funding. At some point, it seems pretty soon thereafter, the, the gins got scrapped, like this factory doesn't exist anymore. And his dream was over, right? <laughs> it like didn't work. One of the other reasons that he did not be successfully become a baron was the nature of the plant itself. It just, the way it grows and the way it has to be harvested just does not lend itself well to the technology for industrial farming that we used then and we still use now. And I think there's this like, still this fatal flaw in his plan. Number one, that he was trying to, there's no way to like exploit, exploit a plant enough to become a bazillionaire without like having a lot of pl precarious plans, right? So it depended on all this unpaid labor because he had modeled what he wanted to do on the cotton industry, right? It's just like so full of flaw. And that time, like a lot of agriculturalists thought that these machines would replace the human labor that they had built their industries off of. And to date, that has not worked, right? Exploited human labor is a huge part of the agricultural industry still. So I knew that the quilt would float. I was confident it would float. I looked up like how many ounces of milkweed fluff per pound you need to float. And um, do you know that number off the top of your head? I, no, I don't. Okay. I don't. <laughs> I don't remember. I know that I needed minimum three, three or four pounds of it in the quilt to float myself, but the quilt's going to have like six or seven pounds of it. Just to be safe. Yeah. Also, because it's a weird shape. I assume it'll like wrap around me like an egg okay. or something, <laughs> you know, like not really near wrap. So then I had to solve what the pattern was going to be, which again, like it's an important decision. And I really was at a dead end. So I just started looking up patterns that have names that have to do with the water. And I found this one pattern called Lady of the Lake. It's like the, the pattern is a fractal half square triangle. It's a half square made of half square. And the way that they're oriented, if you look up this pattern, is made to look like um, when the water is placid and a breeze goes by in the sunset, you get this like texture of like orange and blue or something of all the little waves that are aligned with each other. It's made to look like that. And it's called Lady of the Lake because the most popular book or one of the most popular books at the time was this novel length poem by Sir Walter Scott called Lady of the Lake. The quilt pattern emerges from Maine about 10 years or less after that book comes out. So more research I did about Lady of the Lake is that she's familiar to us from Camelot Tales and the Arthurian cycle, but that character was repurposed into those stories from this ancient female character who pops up in all these different areas before the idea of Europe, like as a unified landmass existed. And she goes by different names, their variations of Nimue or Vivian. When the Camelot Tales and the Arthurian cycle were created, they were created as part of this like larger concerted effort to create one unified history of Europe. There were these kind of like three historical narratives being written together called the matter of Britain, the matter of France, and the matter of Rome. The Camelot tales come around then and are written to like agree with all of those and create this identity and this lore. In the Camelot tales, this highly recognized, revered, familiar female character her main plot driving role is that she produces the Excalibur sword from the lake and hands it to King Arthur, thus making him King Arthur and imbuing him with limitless authority to rule over lands and people. So her role is to kind of symbolize an older way of life and authoritatively say, 
I support this new way of life where this one man is in charge in this like emerging kind of interconnected system of monarchy through all these marriages and all that. So she, she's used to kind of like usher in modernism in a way. And these values, these values of like kind of state supported, state imposed, state sanctioned systems of hierarchy. And I'm trying to relate that ethos to what the milkweed baron did. Like make me the king. <laughs> so like, she's like, you know, interacting with nature and people in this way to like be on top and do it with the support of the government, like to do it in concert as one thing with government. So those are the ways I'm kind of like thinking about relating these like two very separate branches of research. And what you're hearing right now is that I'm still making the stuff because in the incredible duration of time it takes to make all the stuff, I have all this thinking to do, right? So the like thinking and planning and exploring ideas is what I can do now before all the stuff is done so that I can go play with it and allow like the interaction and the dynamic and the narrative and the characters kind of all emerge. So I've made this costume for Lady of the Lake. It has a lot of quilty elements. It is it has the Lady of the Lake quilt pattern elements in it. It looks kind of like it's supposed to be a little Klaus Nomi, a little Star Trek, and a little Evil Queen from Snow White. I think you, I think you accomplished that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and there will be the Milkweed Baron, which I think is going to be like a big headed, big paper mache headed puppet businessman, you know, and and a monarch. And the monarch kind of like interacts with both characters and subjects in many ways, like dependent on the Milkweed plant. It kind of symbolizes like a perilous teetering relationship between industry and human intervention and like ancient natural cycle. When you say monarch, you're referring to the butterfly? Yes, to the butterfly that also has this linguistic cognate to monarchy. So there's this like linguistic link there. And I don't know really what emerges in those three characters dynamics until I have all of them. And I'm like getting there. <laughs> and the quill. I'm trying to kind of like theatricize the making of the quill and like engage in these kind of vignettes on video where these different there's different approaches to all these processes that like end in the quilt i love that you're really like just wringing out every last drop of the process as part of the project yeah and i think like that's somewhere i want to move into in my practice because there is so much process and it is funny like i have a few friends who have made jokes to me about how ridiculous it is that like with the victory dance that I spent just like so much time and labor and months and I got so much help. And like, there's just so much work that went into making that quilt perfect, like to the closest possible viewer. And it was made for this like silly dance from far away on a video once. And we were like, like I shot that film. I shot that video in like a half an hour. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> and, then, and then it was like done, what <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, I guess in this case, I'm trying to like find ways to incorporate more of the making and the meaning that comes through making things in various ways, like different characters associated with making things in various ways through various approaches. Like I'm trying to like portray that in this one project. And not just producing something, but performing the production. And yeah. how many different ways can we perform the production? Yeah. So the quill is made, but has yet to be stuffed. There's still floss to process. And I have these two character costumes. I'm about to make like a head for the evil queen, Lady of the Lake, Star Trek, Cosnomi. And um, the last thing I have is I need to make the Milkweed Baron and the Monarch. And another thing I have already made is I made this Excalibur sword that's also a buoy when I was in residence at the Open Studio Residency at, at Haystack School of Craft a couple of years, a couple of summers ago, two summers ago. I learned, basically learned woodworking to do that. <laughs> so it for no other reason. So why not? It was fun. I sealed it with real buoy paint that's for buoys because later I actually drilled the tip of that sword through a, full of holes so that I could put fishing weights in it so that when it floats in the water, the tip will point down and the handle will point up so that it'll, it'll kind of like bob around that way and look kind of like sword in the stone, right? Like that you would reach down and like unsheath it from the, the lake. And in, in the Lady of the Lake, stories 
the lake itself is this portal to this like fourth dimension that is the old pagan ways with you know more dialogue with nature and it's where she actually brings Arthur she like brings him into the lake and right back out again and he has like 30 years of training and wisdom that prepare him to be a king like the lake is this like incredibly charged place in those narratives but that's also like it was this political repurposing of a previous character and I'm trying to find ways to like explore what 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 her character really was before that with like what little information exists well one of the things that I like to do here on Seam Side is to revisit artists I've talked to a year later to see oh no. what's come of their projects. So no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no pressure, but I can't wait to get an update on Lady of the Lake in Thank whatever you. shape it's in at that point in time. Thank you. Me too. <laughs> I want to take a moment to read you some of your words back to you and get your take on how it fits with this particular project and then in your creative practice in general. But you said at one point that performance is where it's going, it being your work. I don't start with performance, but it doesn't feel done until it becomes a performance. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, and especially in the beginning of incorporating performance and quilt together, I would be making a quilt that I was developing to be 3D, to be sculptural. I was kind of merging my like garment pattern making skills and sculpture skills and quilting skills together to make these patterns that would make these kind of 3D forms. And I was trying to make them very corporal and give them use potential, like make them in a way where they could be worn or performed, but that they would feel finished as a figure sculpture in the room if there wasn't a body in it. And I was kind of doing that as like a fail safe. So during the incredible duration of time necessary to make a quilted object like that, like quilt 3.0, so much more work (laughs) to be also adapting a pattern that's supposed to be like a a regular 2D pattern to a 3D form. There's just so much time there and it gives me so much time to think and make decisions. And I think actually working out the performance decisions about what's going to happen over time, like if it's a performance or a video or some type of other time-based work, like those decisions are so hard to make or or that is the work in many ways. It's a different type of decision-making. I always say a good puppeteer doesn't decide what the puppet does and what its character is like or how it acts and feels until they've made the object, until they've made the puppet. Because If it doesn't really have that kind of attitude about it in the way that it moves, you're working very uphill at that point. I try to make these things that have a lot of use potential, usually usually that have a potential to be worn or be animated by a person in some way. And then I go about thinking really hard about what to do with them. And then I try things out with them and like kind of see what evolves. Well, so much of what you're saying resonates with how I view my own quilt practice as well, which is just keeping your eyes open, trying to open as many doors as possible, especially in the beginning, and then observing Mm. what's happening in front of you. And then at some point becoming intentional about how you want to sculpt that object into what you see happening. But it reminds me of this approach. I was in a workshop with, there's a fiber artist, Bryant Holsenbeck, and it was, uh, we were wrapping wire sculptures with yarn and strips of fabric and things like that. And Bryant says, okay, so go to the big pile of fabric in the middle of the floor and just grab a hunk and then start wrapping it with yarn. You're not making anything, but you're just wrapping it and you're waiting for something to come out. And it was specifically, mm-hmm. she's like, when you start to see an animal in your handful of fabric, then you know it's time to begin to get intentional, right? But until then we're just playing and we're just wrapping. And eventually I saw a little bear come out of my handful of fabric and I I start uh, making the legs, making little bear ears, making a little stubby bear toe. But it was just a great uh, micro experience of the creative process in general, that moment. Yeah, there's an illustrated kind of manifesto or essay written by Peter Schumann, who is the founder of Bread and Puppet Theater. It's called something like, what is the state of puppetry at the end of the 20th century? Because it was in the 90s. And in that, and it's within a book called Puppet Masks and Performing Objects. 
or something like that. I always get it wrong. So in this essay, Peter Schumann is talking about the idea of subject and object, right? Subject, the main character, the controller, the director, and then object is the puppet. And in the writing, he's resisting categorizing things as subject and object, and particularly a opposed to categorizing things as objects and advocating for something you've called thingness. Mm, thingness. Yes. Subject, object, and thing. I love that. And the thing is freed from this dichotomy of domination, basically, or, or of hierarchy. And it's kind of like using people's relationship with objects or attitudes towards objects as a metaphor for um, people's attitudes towards each other or towards nature, like in these kind of other hierarchies and, and dynamics that are dependent upon domination. And so I try to think of the object on some level, if I can, as like the collaborator. And that's way easier for me. Like I was saying before, I have trouble working improvisationally, but I would like to. And that would be a way in which to think of the the stuff and the object and the thing as a collaborator, like you're like having a call and response type of thing. It's easier for me to do that in, in the performance or developing like actions and events that occur. So it's like my dance partner or something. Totally. Totally. <laughs> that, it makes me think of this most recent quilt finish I just did, which I'm calling knife man. And it recounts the story of a time that, I was buying a knife from a local vendor and he made a vaguely homophobic comment to me. I think maybe unaware that oh. I myself was queer. Okay. And so it was just, it was a very um, dense moment that I wanted to capture in this quilt. I okay. used discharge paste to paint on, which is something I learned at Penland. I used discharge paste to paint that story and text onto a piece of black linen. And then I was quilting it down. But because the quilt had a thingness all its own, that linen was so shifty. And it like almost shifted off of the batting that I had basted it to, right? Like the text was almost like jumping off the quilt. And there wasn't a thing I could wow. do about it except respond. I mean, I suppose I could have just like ripped out all the quilting and started over. But there's a part of me that envisions the process like you were just describing, which is you, as as artists, we are collaborating we we have a helping hand in shaping how this thing is going to be but the thing also has its own nature that we can respect or we can subdue yeah i choose respect yeah yeah it's interesting because i mean i'm teaching a lot right now and i'm like i worry that i'll say things like this and it will create that argument like you know you've kind of failed at the thing you were trying to do and then rather than try harder or fix but you're like oh what would i be collaborating with the materials or something? it does sound like it could be an excuse <laughs> like, yeah a little write-off <laughs> but i mean i think if it becomes better in the end like if it becomes like a greater whole than like you could have imagined on your own without the help of the materials if it's like enhanced by the surprises obviously like those are the things we're supposed to always be open to and there are larger connections, aren't there, that I think often often I'll say that improv quilting for me has been like a soft laboratory for life, right? That it gives me a chance to take small risk with fabric because what's the worst that can happen, right? <laughs> you have to sew it back together if you cut mm -hmm. it wrong or something. Mm -hmm. But then practicing <laughs> taking risk in the studio develops this particular muscle in me that translates and carries over, spills over into my relationships with others, with other people in the world. And so, yeah, I, I think it's really fascinating to think about how do we observe what's happening, work with what's happening and go with that, as opposed to walking into a project or walking into a room where there may be other humans and attempting to overexert some predetermined plan right. that you had. Well, it's like, how do you make even more positive outcome in the way you interface with your like lack of control over other things and people? then would come of your best plans that you're trying to That's attend. a beautiful way to say it. That's <laughs> a beautiful way to say it. I'm writing that down. And there are so many kind of like wonderful, magical people out there who you just watch and are like, God, they do that every time. <laughs> just like breathing, second nature. 
Leslie, one thing I would like to do with you for a few minutes, if you don't mind, is look at some of your past projects that are quilt or quilt adjacent. And maybe you could share a little bit about the background or how they came about yeah. or how they live in your mind today, because some of them are at this point a few years old. How's that sound? Oh, great. Everything has a story. It's way more fun to tell the story of each project than it was to actually make it. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Well, then you're in the right place because uh, we're here to tell stories. So I think that's wonderful. Okay. So let's start with Victory Dance. Can you tell us a little bit about that project? Yes, I was doing an artist residency at AS220 in Providence. And often when I'm in a new place and I am in a good place to like start something new and I don't know where to start, I just start researching like local textile histories or quilts in the area. Because before a certain date, some quilt practices were, were kind of regionally specific. So you can get really kind of site specific that way, particularly when you're looking at quilts before these kind of nationally circulated ladies' journal, in which patterns were circulating nationally very quickly. Which like, would have been around the 20s or the 30s or so? Yeah, like really as, as like what we recognize as patchwork quilting really, really took off, like the most kind of iconic style or right around then or a little before. But um, anyway, so I, I found a book in the public library system online that was called like Quilts of Rhode Island. And it turned out to be in a special collection at the Providence Public Library, which was across the street. So I went across the street to that desk to request this book or see if I could see it. And the person guarding the special collection was Angela DeVaglia, who was someone I knew from years ago at Bread and Puppet Theater. And I didn't know that in the ensuing years she had become a librarian or that she lived in Providence. <laughs> it was like serendipity. Just like, I, I depend so much on serendipity when I like, I'm gathering steam, right? Mm -hmm. She found the book for me, many other things. I actually spent like the rest of my residency going to parties that were so fun, that were like all librarians. <laughs> it was so great. But in the back of this book, like when you read the jacket, it would point out notable quilts in the book and it said, and a quilt by a vampire. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, do tell. I looked it up and there was a quilt by a 17-year-old girl near the end of the 19th century named Mercy Brown. She is a well-known name in that in Rhode Island or in that part of you know, Rhode Island because she's probably the latest person who is like had like a highly publicized suspected vampirism case. And the story is that her family, the Brown family, had three girls and the mom and a boy and the dad. So the mother and all the daughters had died of quote-unquote consumption, which was tuberculosis. And it, this obviously was freaking people out in town. Lots of people were dying, but in this particular family was very, very unlucky. So then after all the women were dead, the brother started to be sick. And, you know, in this era, obviously women generally couldn't have jobs. And the brother, the boys were more valuable because they could earn money. So now that the brother was sick, these three men from town decided that the reason that he was sick was these women of poor moral composure in his family who got sick and died because they deserved it or they were susceptible to the devil or something. They decided that one of these women who's dead must be his vampire and that's why he's sick. They pressured Mercy Brown's father to have the women exhumed and examined for evidence of vampirism. And he resisted and eventually like caved because he thought if he like let them look at the bodies and were like, okay, these are just regular bodies in a coffin that they'd be appeased. They hired a medical examiner from Harvard to come exhume the bodies. And Mercy Brown had died last. She had died in a really cold part of the winter where the ground is frozen solid. People would be kept their bodies would be kept in this above ground catacomb until the ground thawed so they could be buried. If you're underground, your body is warmer than if you're above ground in freezing temperatures. So you're able to decompose. And Mercy Brown had been preserved like a popsicle in this catacomb up until very recently. Like she hadn't been buried for very long. She was exhumed first. And one of the things they wanted to look for was blood in the heart. And she had blood in her heart still. 
which the medical examiner explained to them was totally normal and expected because of this preservation. They were like, shut up, science man. <laughs> we'll tell you what's what. And then they, this is, this section requires a trigger warning. It is very gory and violent. Trigger warning, gore and violence. They ended up burning her heart on a rock in the cemetery and then forcing her brother to drink the ashes in order so that he could kill his vampire. He died of consumption a few months later anyway. So this quilt is beautiful. It's a bear's paw pattern. She was a really good quilter. And it's in someone's collection in Rhode Island and published in this book. So my thought was, the objecthood of her quilt and its kind of low cultural status amongst objects in many ways, like low value status. I was thinking a lot about that because like her headstone, for example, is like bolted into the earth with this steel frame because it's been cut off and stolen and defaced like so many times. The the headstone doesn't have any function, any argument to exist other than to stand for her, right? Like at, on the surface level, that's essentially what it's for. It just stands for her. If she had been like a painter, the painting, they stand for her genius. Like that's their main function in a way. And they flatter her by being revered for being beautiful and, and executed with skill and all of that. The quilt, on the other hand, it argues for its existence, for its utilitarian value. And that's like historically what relegates it as like a lesser art form. Because of the quilt's lower status, it, it kind of flies under the radar and it survives everyone in the story. So I decided that what I was going to do was recreate her quilt from the image and replace the dominant color with a green screen. I just got real like key green fabric. Logistically, you could have used any color and it would work, but I used like key green, like identifiable key green. And then a friend of mine, Emmy Bright, brilliant genius artist who also makes quilts now and who lived for a long time in Rhode Island in Providence. She agreed to wear the quilt over her head like a ghost and um, do this dance. And what we talked about was um, doing it. It's called victory dance because it's like the kind of silly victory dance you do when you like get the Christmas present you asked for or make a touchdown. Like, I win, I win. And um, she does this dance in this dilapidated church as a, like a reference to this church and church community and whole community that is also gone, you know, like essentially past. Yeah, I, I guess I'm kind of like trying to pose the quilt as actually winning. <laughs> I think the quilt is winning. Yeah, it survives literally everyone else. <laughs> One detail, I mean, this is, is fascinating. And the image, the still that you have online is fascinating. One detail that you haven't touched on yet, though, is why oh, you yeah. used the key green fabric. Yeah, I made the quilt with the key green fabric. But in the video, the green is replaced with fire. So basically, it's a quilt made of fire. Like, the quilt is not de being destroyed by the fire. It is the fire. <laughs> you know, it's like invigorated by the fire and animated by it. It's incredible. Oh, thank you. I, I had a lot of fun doing that one, other than the immense amount of labor <laughs> that I got a lot of help with. Is the video available online? Is that something we could include in the show notes? Or is it just the video still? Yeah. Yeah, that's on Vimeo. Okay, I'll, I'll find that and get that added so folks can see it. Now, can I ask you about two more quilt projects? Sure. I think a next one would be Ghost. Can we talk about Ghost? Yeah, Ghost is the first quilt I made between when I was 11 and when I was in grad school in my maybe mid, mid to late 20s. I can't remember. So I was living in Richmond, Virginia. I wanted to bring the quilting back in and... I think at that time, due to the kind of discourse around the program I was in and the moment that we were in in contemporary art at that time, and particularly in sculpture, I think I was trying to navigate bringing quilts in and getting people to actually care. <laughs> I, I had been learning uh, Rhino, the 3D modeling software. Previously, when I would pattern things, I would draw them in like, bird's eye view and the side view and all of that on quarter inch graph paper. 
And then when I learned Rhino, I was like, oh, this is literally the same thing. And like, it does, it measures for me. I knew I wanted to make a, a figure, like a form, human form that could be a figure sculpture, didn't have to be, could be animated, unclear. And I wanted to basically to do it by extruding the simplest form that I could from a round quilt block pattern with like radial symmetry. So I'd started researching quilt blocks that originated in Richmond because by then I was thinking about that, like this kind of moment where people are designing quilt blocks and they're common within their local community kind of only. And it's called Farmer's Fancy or Farmer's Delight. And I went and saw the first like documented example of that quilt, um, which was in an archive at the Val Valentine History Museum in Richmond. Luckily, I was teaching, so I had an excuse to like bring a class there and see the thing that I wanted to see. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> and then, um, so I, I basically plotted that pattern in the software and I pulled the middle up. So it made this like big bell shape. I carefully pulled it up enough that it, it would go over my head. Like I could get under that shape. So I could like look at the measurements and volume of that shape in the software and take my own measurements like around my shoulders, for example, and know whether or not I would fit in there. Then I used a CNC machine to plot the pattern because we didn't have like a plotter. So I'd put like a marker in the CNC where the drill bit goes. And it basically like drew the sewing pattern for me. In the software, in all those softwares, there's some command that's called like unroll or unpeel. And it will just take all the planes that you've made and flatten them out and number them. So I did that, had the sewing pattern, put it together. And so all along there, I was like, thinking it could be performed. I'd like it to be performed. I cared a lot about sound at that point. And something I often say, you know, in teaching visual art is when people are struggling with the interpretation of their work and how people feel about it or how people feel the attitude of the work it's supposed to be, you'll get like a long list of suggestions that all have to do with making it different, like making the object or the image different. And what I say is, you know, we're all visual artists here. And when you have a hammer, everything's a nail. But Sound and light will do far more to share this information and, and make it clear than anything visual you can do. I had been thinking just about the power of incorporating sound, and I'm not a musician. I don't have a musical background. There was a, a vocal, a kind of choral vocal technique that I was interested in and attracted to from being at Bread and Puppet Theater, and it's this Georgian singing, Georgian choral singing that uses like harmonies and and the note scale in a way that we wouldn't really, we're not, less familiar with. So I had been just searching around seeing like, is there anyone around here who's interested in that? Like, I know that from New England, but I don't know. That's in my intuition, this is like the right sound. And I couldn't solve the problem. I ended up solving it the way I solved many problems, which is complaining a lot out loud to everyone that I see. <laughs> <laughs> I love complaining. I think it's one of the healthiest things you can do. <laughs> And then so finally, somebody was like, you know, there's this local woman who is named Antonia Fisher Duke, who is a trained opera singer. And she developed this vocal technique called box saw, V-O-X, like body or person. And it's meant to sound like a musical saw. And I thought, oh, God, like the patchwork quilt is, is such a piece, like in this particular style and genre of patchwork quilting where this pattern came from is a very post-colonial American thing. It's like a piece of Americana. It's literally red, white, and blue. <laughs> right. I mean, well, that one, funny that you say that. It's actually like safety orange, white, and blue. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> so I thought, again, I was like, here's a moment of serendipity. This woman agreed to meet me, and she came into the space where the exhibition was going to be, which was like this 10,000 square foot corrugated metal box. It was like, it reverberated so strong. That was one of the main reasons that I decided to go ahead and, and take on solving sound as part of that piece is because when I walked into the exhibition space, it just echoed so huge. And you could like hear almost like violin music, like the vibrations of cars going by on the highway nearby. It was incredible. So she came in there with me and she demonstrated this vocal technique and it filled like every square inch of the entire place. It was stunning. And so she agreed to do this performance where I would lower this bell shaped thing with eye holes over her. She would perform the technique. She decided, I, I, I worked it out with her. I was like, well, in, in a perfect world, I imagine this is just kind of like going on all night as people are milling about the opening. 
But being someone who's not trained in singing, I didn't know that that's really exhausting and impossible. So she said that she thought she she thought what would be comfortable for her would to do it for 15 minutes on and then take a break for 15 minutes and alternate that way. And that was what we did is I would lower it over her like a theater prop, right? I had like a rope going up to the ceiling, down the wall on like a cleat. And I would lower it over her and then I would unhook the rope and take it away. So she wasn't like tethered anymore. And she would sing. And I thought, you know, often when visual artists, I think are, starting to work with time-based performance like that, you like will try to do something that like happening or unfolding during the opening, thinking like people will just kind of walk by my work or look at it a little while and then look at everyone else's equally. But something about that being time-based in a performance where something's quote unquote happening and the like very theatrical aesthetic of it made it such that every single time she sang, everyone would come over and make this big giant horseshoe shape facing her only in front of her like people would rarely kind of walk around the back because it's like impolite or something you know it's like weird to be like creeping up on someone <laughs> even if they're covered in a giant bell-shaped quilt yes or maybe you know you don't want to be on stage right mm-hmm. and it would feel like you're on stage yeah this just happened every time and it was revealing for me in many ways just like what happens when I like work this way especially when I work this way in a group show and like what are the ethics around that like stealing the whole audience for 50, every 15 minutes or something you know or not like all of them but like changing the way people are moving around the space and moving them back to my work over and over again I felt a little bit like <laughs> attention hog <laughs> Oopsie. well it's a beautiful thing in and of itself and I can only imagine what the Vox saw sounded like in that in that open warehouse of the space It's also on Vimeo. Okay. So if you have like, you hook up the best speakers you've got, you will hear some beautiful stuff. Folks, I'm going to track that down for us. You'll see it in the show notes. The last thing, and Leslie, you've been so generous with your time. Thank you. The last quilt that I would like to talk with you about, and if there's something else you want to share, there's time for that too. But I'm interested in the piece you call For Rehearsal, because I feel like a lot of our practices overlap there as well. Yeah. So by the time I made that piece, this was like, I started calling that series the mischief quilt, like casually, not in any official context. (laughs) That was probably like, we're getting like four pieces in or five pieces in. And they're so laborious, like I make one, I feel like I make one every couple of years because it's so intensive. That one, I had had in the back of my mind, like thinking about other just incredibly simple forms. The simplest form I could make for a body or to be a body or to contain a body. To like de-identity the body in a way, because they're often cover the face or whole head along with the rest of you. And I was thinking about those sleeping, those uh, mummy bags, mummy sleeping bags. And I just hadn't started on it because at that point I didn't want to like casually pick a quilt pattern. I didn't want to pick one aesthetically because I knew there's all this like unknown history or history at least that I didn't know or that the average person doesn't know at the time about different patterns and that could change later. So I really was struggling to solve that one. And Somehow I ended up like remembering, I knew and I'd heard these stories about the fact that the log cabin quilt block pattern was purportedly, it was inspired by stolen cat mummies from Egypt. It's a mummy, right? It's like inspired by mummy. And it's, it's tapped into this whole like extraordinarily painful and complex like colonial violence. So since then, there actually was an episode of Radio Lab where they talk a little bit, not about the quilt pattern, but about this history where all of these animal mummies, but mostly cats, were stolen. Tens of thousands of them were pilfered from Egyptian tombs around the mid-1800s by mostly English and some French explorers. And what they would do is they would just take everything that they found and mail it back home. And then back in England, people would go through the bounty and be like, well, we want this, we don't want this, we want this, we don't want this. And so the things they wanted were mostly the craft forms and sculptural forms that were more associated in England at that time with like men making them. (laughs) And then they would literally like unwrap the mummy just to see what was underneath and discard the finely made textiles 
to this day, I have heard a rumor that there are artifacts from that era still in the British Museum's coffers somewhere, storage, wrapped in the mummy wrappings, like being used as packing peanuts. What? <laughs> rumor, rumor, someone confirm or deny. Um, so, yes, I, I was asking questions. Number one, I like research, right? I like learning about what I'm working with in part to try to be responsible for it or to at least know if you're getting into some kind of challenging territory, like how are you being challenging and why? You don't want to get blindsided. What, are, what decision did you make to like put yourself out there and, and enter a dialogue about something really painful? To what end? You know, like for what reason? And I think the best thing you can do is just learn as much as possible about the forms and the aesthetics and the tools and all the things that you're using. I also think when an artist engages in a lot of research, if something about that research and context isn't built back into the form, if the research doesn't then somehow influence the actual making process and the end product, like why? Like just write a paper, <laughs> you know, like, or, or sometimes there's like a tome of text like next to the piece. And if you don't like take both in, you're not really kind of fully appreciating it. So I try to avoid that. I try to push myself to like build the research back into the form. And this piece I felt like was a good example of like where I felt successful at that. I had learned this thing about the quilt, the log cabin pattern. And then I made the form informed, the mummy form is informed by that history. So made this mummy suit. It's made so that I can wear it. It has a zipper that starts at my eye and kind of spirals inside the pattern around to my feet so I can get in and out. And then I do this performance where it has kind of two narratives in it. The first one is sharing this history of the quilt block pattern in this kind of like theatrical way with a lot of attitude. And at some point, the audience, at this point in the story where the stolen goods are shipped back to England, the audience crowd surfs me from my home, which is the stage, to my display at their hometown cultural institution, which is usually the bar. And I come out as an angry dead cat. So, <laughs> which is fun and dark. And like, I hope that it is also received as critical of that history. Anyway, there's that. And then within the performance too, there's also, I call it for rehearsal because the idea of the mummy is this kind of like transition between life and death. Like it's like kind of a quasi death, quasi life state. And when my father was terminal and I was taking care of him, I would often walk through the living room and he'd just be in there alone, no TV on, and he'd have a bed sheet over his head. <laughs> so he was like laying on the couch, like just reclining with the bed sheet up over his head. And it was such a like striking image. Like it was like a Halloween ghost or like when Alec Baldwin and Tina Davis put on bed sheet in Beetlejuice to become like visible and scary ghosts. And it's like so cute and it doesn't work. It looked like that. And he was dying, right? Like he was, I, in the performance, I say he was half dead because he, half of his body was paralyzed at that time. And he was terminal, right? Like it wasn't like he was in the process. He was like quasi life. And so I fictionalize our interactions around that. And I say, well, he was rehearsing being dead and I was giving him notes and like giving him suggestions about how to appear more dead. And like, you know, you gotta like, sit still in front of the window and spring up like this when someone walks by, <laughs> like all these things. And like, and then his response is like, never makes sense <laughs> because in real life, he was like very compromised at that time and like, didn't make a lot of sense. So I propose in the performance that you make a garment for rehearsal, a garment to like rehearse being dead and you visit your loved and hated ones in life and get them used to your corpse. <laughs> like, as like this kind of act of generosity, right? Just get used. It's okay. Like, just think about me being dead. I'm here to like help you through it by wearing this like death suit. And also one of my favorite parts about that part of the narrative and that performance is that I like perform being a brat, right? Like, I'm not a brat at all. <laughs> JK, I'm a huge brat. <laughs> but um, I basically, I'm like in, in, the, in the fictionalized exchange, I'm like, What's your death shroud, Dad? A bed sheet? My death shroud is highly researched and laboriously made and partially based on stolen cat mummies. What is your death shroud? <laughs> what is your death shroud for? A bed? Like, I'm, like, trying to, like, one-up him, how kids sometimes get, like, 
the child generation will get competitive with the parent generation, try to like outdo them in some way. Or my partner really likes to say that um, my stepdaughter's form of rebellion is being better than him at everything that he loves. <laughs> and if she doesn't, she definitely doesn't do it in a spirit of you know competition or you know, she doesn't want him to feel better. I think she just is better in a lot of things. <laughs> just turns out. It turns out like Magic the Gathering. Leslie, it has been such a pleasure to live inside of your brain <laughs> for the last hour. Thank you so much. Oh, my God. Thank you. It's like I just contain too much about these things to put anywhere. <laughs> we'll help you hold them. We're here for it. Now, what I tell you, isn't that Leslie a force of nature? I just sat back and let her tell her stories. I hope you don't mind. Now, before we meet again, don't forget you might want to grab that tiny quilt tutorial in the show notes below. Make yourself a little tiny quilt. Who knows? Maybe there's a cold mouse in your house, or maybe you got one little toe that's a bit chilly. Till our paths cross again. I hope you're up to something good. I hope you're sewing something good. And I hope to see you soon. Maybe on the nook. Who knows?